take a look at this boat. She's one of the most beautiful yachts ever built. She's Marikita, launched in 1911, and she's a piece of maritime history. An antique, but very much afloat, and being raced like she was new. I once joined her for a week in Italy sailing aboard as regatta crew, and it's one of the best experiences I've ever had. She's sailed as she would have been in 1911. No winches, everything's done with pulleys on the deck, and she's gaff rigged, so there's lots of cordage. She has 18 crew, uh, six permanent, six sign on for a whole season, and then they take on another six for each and every regatta. Now, she was restored to be sailed at these big classic regattas, especially in the Mediterranean. She's a big class yacht, with the length on deck or overall being 95 feet, taken out to 125 feet over her bowsprit and boom. She draws 12 feet, so she's no creek crawler. She was rebuilt and relaunched in 2004 by Fairley Restorations on the Hamble, now sadly no more. The craftsmanship of her restoration was superlative, and I saw her at the time. Every feature about her was excellent. They'd recreated a dream boat from another time, and now instead of being in black and white, here was the honey colour of her varnished hatches, the polished brass of her fittings, and the lovely warm grey of her teak decks, which feels so good under bare feet. She's composite construction. So she has a steel rib cage or frame over which wooden planks are fastened and this is how she was built originally. It makes her very strong and she has been and she can be raced hard. This is her first owner, Arthur Stoddard, who was 49 when he had her built in 1911 and here's her designer, William Fife. She's built to the 19 metre rule. Only four boats were built uh, to that rule all in 1911 and Fife built two of them. The other two were by Nicholson and Milne. They raced briefly as a class before the First War, and then Marikita was sold to Norway. She raced again in Britain between the wars, but there was no 19 metre class by then. And she ended up in a mud berth in World War II, first at the Deben and later at the Orwell in Pin Mill. That was where she was discovered in 1987 by William Collier, who was scouting out such classics for the famous Ferrari collector Albert Obrist. Obrist, who had sold most of his cars, had moved on to boats and had restored and just relaunched the 107 foot 1931 Fife Schooner Altair. She's often cited as the restoration that set the standards for all to follow. In 1991, Obrist set up Fairly Restorations, the high quality classic yacht specialist on the handle and Marikita was acquired awaiting an owner. Ernst Klaus and Peter Levanos came to her rescue, having a superb restoration completed between 2001 and 2004. They kept and raced Marikita until her centenary year, with Jim Tom as her well-known skipper. And then, ten years after her launch, with her new owners and new skipper, I got a chance to sail aboard. This was at Porto Santo Stefano for the Argentario Sailing Week, held every June since 1998 in lovely southern Tuscany. I was to be one of six regatta crew they take on for the week. First things first, you get assigned your personal water bottle. No single-use plastic here. I met some old friends, uh, Cornelius here in the morning and here Dickie on the right. The pros are up early. This is Billy the Bosun on the left, and the girls Robin on the left, and Pippa are sailors as well as Chief Stewardess and Cook. Here's George, the captain, who was Jim Tom's mate, talking to Matty, the mate, and here's the helmsman, also the owner, Johnny Coolcut, and here are her professional crew and owners. And now let's meet a sailing legend, Harold Cudmore, who is our tactician for the week. The days start with warm-up exercises, which include a few stretches, and then we all get a bit hands-on as well. This is a good idea. 
and it certainly gets you ready for when you're going to do some pulley hauling. Up she goes. Cudmore is already counting down to the start and I'm up here on the foredeck with Richard Saul and the bowman Jerome Collet. Jerome's a relaxed kind of cat until he needs to do something like this. Matty, who runs the foredeck, is also up here with Millie. This is my view on main sheet, which is called by Peter or Tubsy Brook here on the right. And here they are hanging on the jib topsail. This is yours truly, patting it down like a good little sail. And it's good to be out on the bowsprit when your office bound. Of course, in my head, I still think I'm the schooner man of my youth. And here's the jackyard topsail going up. And now she looks fully dressed, with a lot of sail area high up to catch the wind. Note the jib topsail, which is flaked and tied up uh, like a sausage. It's tied with wool, ready to be broken out by tugging the sheet when needed. With an upwind sail area of more than 6,000 square feet, she's capable of kicking up some sea dust, even in these light airs. If people in Santa Stefano look out of their window, they get a nice view today. And here are some other big boats, Shamrock and Cambria. Shamrock 5 here was the first J-Class to be built in 1930 for Thomas Lipton's fifth attempt to win back the America's Cup for Britain. She's uncompetitive in the modern J-Class, but you can see that she just leaves us in her wake. She's wood on steel frames as well. And here comes Eleonora, the replica Hereshoff schooner. She's the biggest vessel here. And this is how we look between tacks with Millie calling the trim on the jib with hand signals. Uh, this one's ordering three sausage rolls and a donut to be sent up to the foredeck. And then here are the folk of another fife. This is Halloween from 1926 and a Bermudan design slowly overtaking us. The next boat to overtake us is Cambria, the 23 meter and she takes about four minutes to haul ahead here. Hand over hand, she's the faster boat, and although our gaff handicap will help, she's the one to beat. She won in our class the year before. And has Cudmore got a plan? I like his look of concentration, and it turns out the next day he will have. But we're sailing well, and the pros have taken us newbies in hand. Hauling on ropes can be hard work, but my hands aren't sore at all, really. A few hours later, we get to the end of the race and realise Cambria has missed a mark. She stopped and her sails are coming down. They get radioed. They put them back up to carry on racing. Later, Cudmore notes that it gave us 23 minutes on them. And so, we've won day one. We have a beer with our debrief and we feel good but there's more to do. Cudmore mentions the light airs are suiting us with Shamrock 5 as well, plus they left their big Genoa behind. Saturday is a magic day, not just to be sailing in these waters, but we're going to see a master tactician at work. The race is about 26 miles in a fairly flat diamond course north of Porto Santa Stefano, out into deeper water, and then round a second mark in the Bay of Talimoni. The third mark is an inshore-ish mark, uh, and then back uh, to port uh, in the south. The wind forecast uh, is backing southwest to southeast, mainly light airs, which hopefully will suit us. We have a good pep talk from Johnny and from George the next day, and the mood is good. The race starts well and shortly after midday we rounded the second mark. Cambria is ahead of us and we can see her slowed right down with yachts around her. They're all pointing in different directions, sails hanging like laundry on a quiet day. Away off to port on the shore side the New York 40 Chinook is hugging the shoreline and we can see that she has wind. It's coming offshore. 
Tudmore alters us to steer between Chinook and Cambria, and unbelievably, there's enough air to carry us past them. We are literally 200 yards, one cable to their port side, and we move past. We hit the convergence ourselves about a minute later, and Cudmore has everyone lying on deck with the sails sheeted midships. We don't even dare to breathe as we feel the 36 tons of lead as her keel moves through the pellucid green waters below. A few hundred feet finds us back in a zephyr of air, and we're sailing again. It was an extraordinary thing to call, and even better to witness, especially sailing that close to the convergence zone, which was caused by the meeting of an offshore and onshore breeze. Today was a day that you would call a heads out of the boat day, Harold tells me later. We were all looking at what was happening around us. Uh, so that was good, but there was also a lot of luck involved. <laughs> That's what he said. It gave us another decisive win, and Harold was rightly congratulated. When he came into the Marco Polo restaurant later that evening, he got a round of applause. After that win, the next day seems assured. And we are on a high. Captain George tells me that this is the first time since she was launched that Marikita won three races in a row in a regatta. It's an auspicious season start. And that year, she goes on to win the Panerai Trophy in the big class overall. It was a shame to hear she was laid up in Lymington under covers in 2015 and has been ever since. But there are a few of us who can't afford to run boats at the moment. <clears throat> She remains a boat of dreams, a vessel that others flock to see, and I treasure that week, the fantastic sailing, and seeing Mr. Cudmore's genius at work. Yeah, thanks, Marikita.